Uh, so, uh, hi, I'm uh, Ori Peckelman. I'm a co-founder of Platform.sh. It is a platform as a service. You get push and stuff happens. And uh, this talk is called "There is uh, Yeah, There is No Container." Uh, so, uh, as we're in kind of Paris Container Day, I would imagine that a bunch of you might know what a container is. Um, but like. I've made 66 slides, so we can choose on which ones to spend more time. So uh, we're kind of going to di distribute the guys in, in three groups. So kind of group A is containers. Sounds interesting. Hmm, I came to learn. So who, who kind, of, kind of feels they're more in the, uh, I'm just trying to figure out what's happening there. It sounds cool. So group A. OK. Yeah, there is a representation of group A. Group B would be kind of, I use Docker in production. It works, and I don't really have to care, or production or in development, I don't really care how, how it works, the internals, uh, but I like containers, it works. Who's, who's, who's on group B? Okay, so uh, uh, you should know uh, uh, that <laughs> this is group C. <laughs> so I uh, kind of, yeah, I have kernel foo. Um, so who knows who, who this guy is? Only only five or six? Oh, okay. Please check out uh, Lord Buckethead. Very important for your self-esteem. So, uh, yeah, this is where I say, oh, 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 I'm talking after Jesse Fraisel. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> imposter syndrome and stuff, but okay. I, I'll, I'll, so... Uh, before before we, we 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 delve kind of into my talk, general considerations on on okay containers are cool, good, uh, but why do we need containers? What problems do containers solve? And basically, it's kind of a packaging thing, right? It, they allow us to take so complex software and put it in 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 packages that are easier to manage, and this is something we, we already knew how to do, right, with virtual machines. We knew how to install everything on the virtual machine, yay, we, it works. Six months later, yeah, it, it works. And now we know how to clone them. We have a machine, uh, virtual machine images, and so it becomes really, really easy uh, to deploy. We even, you know, do it like with appliances. People clone the hard disks, and you would go and put the hard disk inside the rack inside the data center, and we knew how to you know, install complex software like that. And basically, uh, containers are uh, uh, an iteration on this, like putting the whole machine in your data center, uh, but at a lesser granularity, let's say. Uh, it's something where we say, okay, but it's less expensive than having a, a person go into a data center and push a thing. Uh, so it's kind of first economics, right? And, and, and in a way, you know, the container therefore is, uh, you know, it's an abstraction. It's uh, saying, hey, well, I'm, I'm going to manage my complex software at a lesser granularity. Okay. And in general terms, when we think about software, there are kind of two orthogonal things that always come into play, which is nuts and bolts, how it's done how one thing calls another, what are the data structures, and abstractions, how we reason about it. And the interesting thing about software is that abstractions are not abstract, they're real. So when you're writing a YAML file, uh, you're interacting with an abstraction. Right? The fields that are going to be in that YAML file are going to expose the interface of the abstraction. How do I think about that thing? When I name something, so if I'm you know, if I say, hey, this thing is going to be a container that is going to run my SQL. Uh, the number of things I'm going to have to tell, talk about the MySQL is going to de describe the abstraction I have of what my SQL might be. So if I have the whole code source of my SQL in the YAML file, I'm at a very, very, you know, not abstract thing. And if I just say, hey, I need my SQL, I don't care then we'll, we're at a different level of abstraction. So we'll start with some abstractions, then we'll go to some nuts and bolts, 
And this is the canonical image of the container, right? Something that is orderly, where we put software in these small opaque boxes. And the, these boxes have a common simple interface where we don't care about what's inside. So we can manipulate the container without having to think about uh, what the hell is running inside. We can move them, we can install them, we can run them without just using a very soft, you know, simple abstraction, which is the name of a piece of software. That's good. Uh, but, you know, if we think about it in, non, in the non-abstract way, like in the nuts and bolts way, uh, the reality is inverse. And um, the container doesn't create opacity from the outside in. Uh, kernel. Uh, UID zero. They see everything. Nothing is hidden from them. Right? Root, the kernel, the, the fact that you've put it into a container doesn't make it so. For the kernel, this is the reality. They see, you know, all the moving parts are still spinning there. Uh, the, the container is kind of, it's opacity, but from the inside out. It means that we're using a bunch of kernel features uh, to lessen the view of a specific process on its surrounding world. So, uh, and basically we're kind of, we say, hey, we segregate the outside world using namespaces, so we hide everything that is not in your namespace. Oh, we're gonna tell you that you can't use everything from the outside world, so this device is not yours. Uh, you can only get this much memory. These are C groups. Sometimes we're gonna use namespaces again, and we're gonna use this segregation in order to lie, outright lie. And, hey, the world is different than what you think. And we're going to limit the executable uh, capabilities regarding the kernel itself, because, uh, uh, again, these are not, we'll go into this, but we, these are not things that were built into uh, Linux from the beginning. So we're, we're dipping to nuts and bolts here, and, and, and let's try and try to, to create a container, see what precisely a container is. So there, you know, you have an operating system. Yay. We're only talking about Linux here. And, you know, no software in an operating system runs outside the operating system. So your machine code, your assembly, still needs to hook in to the operating system in order to be able to run. Nothing else runs. So basically on Linux, we only have, only have one thing that runs, elf binaries. And they're gonna interact with the system through a very specific interface, which is called system calls. So it's gonna ask for resources, launch other processes, uh, play sound, always through these system calls. Uh, so we, you know, not play sound through the system call, but ask to be able to talk to the sound driver through the system call. And uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, nicely enough, uh, Linux would expose higher level constructs when we interact with the system call. So you could, for example, and that's very, very often in Linux world, it's going to expose the pseudo file system. So you would have kind of a, a, a more uh, readable interface to interact with. Um, so uh, basically, you know, in Linux, we're going to start processes. We have three ways to do that. And uh, when, and how do we, you know, when we run this process, how do we make it so that the world will seem smaller to it? We can send, you know, when we start the process, we can set a, center, a certain number of flags, of parameters. Uh, and so when it gets created, so we're going to use like the clone system call to run the process. And we're going to tell, hey, it's the same process running, but it's not precisely the same, and it sees the world a bit differently. And we have a, a bunch of parameters called clone new something. So, uh, for example, one of the nice ones is clone new UTS. And this one basically says uh, when we are going to, when you're going to call, this, to call these system calls, like set host name, it's going to be only for you and your namespace. 
So it's the same system call as you would call normally from outside the container, but it basically means that, hey, next time anyone with this namespace call get host name, give it whatever I put in the set host name thing. So suddenly I have a process. We have tricked this process, and it doesn't read the same reality as the other processes on the system. And uh, uh, basically, we can, you know, these manipulations we can do either when we create a process with clone or by calling later unshare. And it doesn't have precisely the same signature because, yay, yeah, nothing should be easy. And, or you could assign a namespace to a running process using set and s. And uh, so, you know, lying about the, the host name is nice, but that's not really a container, right? So, what else can we isolate? We can and this is probably the most important thing, we can isolate the file system. And when you think about OCI and you know, all these container images, this is always about that. How do I create an image of a file system where when my process will run, it will run, it will see a root file system that is usable, and, uh, but it is not the same as the host machine. Again, if the kernel looks at it from the outside, it doesn't say that. If you have a mount, it's a mount, uh, it's not spatial in any way. Uh, and, uh, okay, I'm not going to talk about capabilities. It's important, but yeah. Um, so basically when we do that, so we, we kind of recreate this, uh, uh, we call this system call, uh, clone new NS. And NS is just a, a namespace. So it's weird. Uh, it's because it was the first one. So it was just called namespace, and then they added the other ones. What this should have been called clone ns mount or storage or something like that, probably mount. Uh, and, and we can basically do you know a lot of manipulation afterwards. We create this new namespace for the mounts, and we can unmount everything, do that. That's good, and then we can remount some stuff, and possibly you know. Uh, uh, map everything we need until we get a usable uh, file system on which we can run processes. Uh, you could use something absolutely crazy, like a layered file system, an overlay FS, and, a, and then you can, you know, this image you've created, uh, you can mount it and then mount on top of it something else. Uh, please, uh, yeah, that's not always a very, very good idea. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, so basically, but container runtimes and, and image formats are all about just describing how are we going to do step by step these multiple mounts until we get to a file system that is not the same as the host and that is a usable Linux system. Uh, we can uh, isolate IPC. So we don't want you know, our process to be able to talk with strangers. That's bad. And uh, we can, oh, cool. We can isolate process IDs. And that's, we, we're, we're already with the storage, we're kind of filling in a container, right? Because most of the world has disappeared. Now that we can isolate process IDs, the other processes disappear. So if I do, you know, PS, AUX, I only see myself and maybe, you know, the other processes in the same namespace. Uh, oh yeah, and and the kids. So namespaces are hierarchical, and and you can run containers in containers in containers in containers, uh, 32 times. And no, it's not a bad ID at all. It's just a Docker bad ID, not a bad ID. Uh, and now we're gonna kind of, hey, and you know that would be important. You're gonna need to isolate the network, and you can create this namespace. But it doesn't, you know, it's a namespace. So it doesn't create an IP by itself. It's a namespace, so you're gonna have, you know, an interface that you can namespace to it, and uh, you're gonna discover that networking is hard anyway. Uh, and please don't use NAT. Uh, and, and you can use just, you know, very simple kernel mechanics like IP tables. Uh, this is what we do. We basically live in a totally flat IP world and a, a cluster of containers is just going to be IP tables and who can talk to whom. That's a Munich uh, So uh, do man namespaces. Um, it's really well written. 
so and it's quite amusing that you know hey if i want to learn about containers i can read cool shit on hacker news or i can type man namespaces and it's kind of well written uh, so um one of the really cool things in, in, in the namespaces world is user namespaces. So basically everything I'm talking about is something that can be invoked from user space. These are not things that you need a uh, root for. So a, a, a running process can create sub-processes as, as long as it can, you know, it has the, the capabilities to, to, to fork or to exec. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that is appearing now in the Docker world, so it's like three months, I think, right? Docker people? I don't know. Um, but it's, um, so we, inside the, 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 the container, you can be a different UID, and then the outside, nice. And we've talked about C groups. So this is where C groups and namespaces come together. Okay, you can namespace C groups, so you can apply C groups to namespaces, which is cool. Um, and as more competent people than me have already talked about security, I'm not going to really get into it, but you have uh, multiple layers of uh, uh, cherry on top security. You can add like seccomp, and, uh, which is kind of a big sledgehammer that says, boom, you can't use these calls. Uh, and then you have a kind of seccomp BF BPF that says, you can, yeah, that one in that context, maybe, we'll see. So uh, this is the, uh, the thing that the, the serious people. Um, so, uh, and in a way, because it's Linux and we have this, you know, ID uh, that we represent everything through a file system, of course, we expose a nice pseudo file system that allows us to introspect that. So we can use make dear to create namespaces and C groups. That's all. You don't need any specific executable, basically, on your machine in order to create and use containers. All of these are simple kernel features, mm -hmm. and you can use ls and cut and make dear, and containers will happen. And so I just go, and because systemd creates uh, namespaces and C groups and stuff like that, C groups anyway exist always, there's always. And uh, by default, on any Linux machine you're gonna run this stuff, you'll see namespaces, it's not, you don't install software to get containers. Now, kind of, as you can see, so the, the title is There is no container. And there is no container in the sense that one, if you imagine the container like this opaque thing from the outside, nah, that's not the reality. And it's that way. And there is no container because basically there are going to be semantics that are going to be different per implementation of these different features together. And uh, so, so uh, we've seen this about com, right? There is a container thing there. We could call it a container. Uh, you're going to have, you know, Docker, and Docker says, okay, I'm about small atoms, one small piece of software that is going to expose a single port with a single process. LXC that is going to say, I'm going to recreate the feeling, the total feeling of a virtual machine. I feel I am in a Debian. I can do Apata get installed. Yay! Uh, fire gel, which is basically there for, so you can run games and, and not care. So it is going to be about sandboxing, really unsafe code, but still that needs to be able to run in a GUI. So basically these are the abstractions, right? We've, talked, we've started with the, the idea of uh, we're nuts and bolts versus abstractions. And each form of container is going to have an ID, a different ID about what a container is. Uh, and when you look too much at the nuts and bolts, we're kind of going away from this uh, orderly ID of containers and into the understanding that basically we are aligning multiple software with paradigms that are different, with semantics that are different, and we put them together in order to create a feeling of isolation or basically to generate my abstraction that will allow me to manage software at scale. Uh, so, our, our so if now we think kind of about containers now as their abstraction. So, what what is the abstraction of a container? When when if you're going to extract from your YAML file, okay? So from the Kubernetes, from the Compose, from the Swarm, um, um, 
from your Docker file. Uh, what is the, the your API of that thing? Okay, what is the abstraction it uh, proposes? And the idea is basically a container should describe, and basically should only describe, what is the minimal subset of resources the program needs in order to read, uh, to run. Sorry. And uh, what are the, the, the what is the understanding from the outside world of this piece of software that is needed in order to run it? So we have this in order for us to be able to have this kind of simple, uniform interface. So uh, to be clear, what, what does that mean? It means hey, okay, if we look at Docker, we can know what is the abstraction of Docker by basically examining the Docker file. So we can see what are the fields, what is the metadata that is required in a Docker file to understand what is the abstraction of Docker. So it will say, hey, I need a base image. And the base image we know, we've understood, I think, it's a, a, a blob, right? It's someone, someone else built. It's a succession of bytes that is totally opaque and that has a name. So it comes from the store, it comes from a registry. Uh, but we know nothing about it except its name and hopefully that it works and We're going to describe a working directory somewhere. We're gonna do stuff Interestingly enough in the docker world uh, the first thing is not read only so by default unless you do something uh, When you are going to mix and match together. We're going to do this mounting and mashing of the new NS of the the storage layer namespace and we're going to mix them together. Um, we're going to have a build step, which is kind of the bash script running. It's going to manipulate that before we run stuff. We're going to say, hey, there's a port we can expose to the world. And we have environment variables that are going to allow us to spatialize my container, maybe. And last but not least, we have a single command to run. So this is what... Uh, Docker says is the general contract for running software. So if you're going into a world in which you say, hey, let's, let's containerize everything and let's containerize everything Docker style, it means that you consider this to be software. No other thing is allowed as the interface of software. Uh, and, uh, and this is basically kind of, you know, it's the software contract that is exposed to, to us, the system operator or the developer. Uh, when we chose, uh, so platform that says she's a pass, we're running uh, in production uh, on containers for the last kind of four years, something like that. And we never got to use Docker. So it was too early when we started. And the contract wasn't just right. So when we were thinking about what is our contract and that we need from the software. Um, it was more about kind of how do we build this software? So the opacity of the base image didn't seem right. How do we build everything it depends on? I want to be able to build from zero, from source, from a, a new world, everything and arrive at precisely the same state of the world. I don't want to depend on binary blobs. Um, and the thing is that kind of software, weirdly enough, is not just code. It's a code with infrastructure on which it relies. A, an initial data, a set, set of data. Really, software doesn't run without data usually. And anyway, not useful software. Configuration. Uh, uh, so we're then kind of internally talking about, hey, what's our contract? And, and, and of course, you know, at any point in time, uh, we've heard, so please refer to the blah blah talk about why don't we use console, why don't we use thingy A, B, or C. Uh, Docker has uh, user namespaces for the last three months. We are in operations. This is not JavaScript. This is not, hey, Vue.js is cool, let's... So, uh, uh, again, everything I'm saying is not that Docker is bad or containers are bad. Uh, it's the question of, hey, what is the abstraction level uh, you're working at? 
Uh, are we taking our physics set or our organic chemistry set? Uh, we started from the molecule. The first kind of, the, the minimal abstraction we have is not a piece of code, a repo of code, but a repo that represents represent codes plus the infrastructure. Uh, so the, basic, the basis for us would be to have everything immutable, because the only way stuff works at scale is if it is immutable. Any functional programmers around? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, okay, you know, the, the nice thing, the, the, the best citation about function, everyone, anyone that thinks that the world is mutable has not heard about the concept of time. That's a cool thing. Okay, uh, so this is what kind of the, 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 the basic contract we needed. Uh, and uh, and so, so when we did it, we basically said, okay, this is also our, our layering, right? Because when you put shit, sorry, stuff in boxes, uh, the idea is that once we have this abstraction and put it in a box, uh, uh, we have system boundaries. And now we can replace it. And I have no doubt in my mind that we will change our containerization methods in the future. We're now talking about dropping containers and using KVM because we can probably achieve the same level of density today with KVM and with simpler operational <laughs> uh, work? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, and, 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 this, you know, and these abstractions are important because once you set the, the, kind of the correct level of abstractions, you get to have features. It is basically impossible to implement at a different abstraction level. The fact that we consider our thing is the molecule, so a running system with its configuration, it's uh, persistent, so we run containers with persistence because we run everything on a distributed, replicated, fault-tolerant file system because we understand the life cycle of every process and we know when files are closed. And we know when there is a packet on the network so we can do operations because we know what net state the network is. Uh, so when you have this, you get features, and we have features like we can take a whole. She means calculators. We can take a full running cluster, and we can clone it. It can be terra level. It can be of arbitrary complexity with, you know, microservices and stuff. And we can own for every Git branch you create, we create on the fly an ephemeral staging server that is precisely the state of production. Every time you test a new feature you test that it deploys correctly to precisely production with all the production data, no lorem ipsums, which means that putting shit into product stuff into production never fails. Uh, it means that we have full auditability over the whole infrastructure. You cannot mutate the state of production other by describing this mutation in Git. If I want to upgrade uh, my SQL from 5.5 .5 to anything else, I change a single character, I get push, it's the infrastructure's job, and I have an audit log of what happened. Uh, when you understand how stuff interacts with the file system, when it's part of your contract, uh, when you understand the network, one of the coolest things you can do is not only you can do persistence layer stuff in production, but you can also implement high availability. So precisely uh, whatever, you know, uh, uh, the blah blah, car, people said, is right. Uh, we use different tools. The, the, their build tool looks really, really mighty, mighty nice. Looks much like our own manufacturer. That's about it. I don't think we have much time for questions unless you can do that in 10 seconds. Thank you very much. Ori Peckelman, Abstractions, Nuts and Balls.